SELFSI, Spoken Easy Language for Social Inclusion. First, let me start by saying thank you for the Trieste University, for SELFSI project, for inviting me here. It's really a great pleasure that I can be here. Actually, this is my very first time in Italy. So I'm very curious and happy, although the weather is not so great, but it's great to be here. And um, thank you for the introduction. It was very nice. And uh, it actually leads me straight to the point. And this is my own research, which I would like to introduce to you with a couple of words. Uh, but before I do that, I say one thing. I am an expert of easy Finnish and plain Finnish, but not really an expert of plain English. So in case I speak too quickly or I use complicated words, I apologize. And I hope that you mention it and you ask. So I try to make it better because that is actually the best thing when we talk about spoken language. We can do it again. If I would be writing here, I couldn't correct or repair my talk. So please say. Okay, a few words about my research. Um, I have been doing this quite a while because I was doing my research uh, and at the same time working in Selkokeskus, the Finnish Center for Easy Language. And um, doing research on your free time as a hobby is not perhaps the best solution. But as Pia Giorgio said, I just fin finalized it uh, last year. And now I'm happy to tell you a few things about the results I got and how they are related to guidelines for spoken easy Finnish. But this is my, my very topic today. Um, <clears throat> The research I have done is conversation analytical research on conversations of uh, spoken situations between persons with mild or moderate intellectual disabilities and professionals working with them. And the data I've been working with is uh, video uh, recorded, so it's authentic uh, conversational data and uh, different kind of uh, conversations, including situations where people are just chatting with each other without any institutional task. Then in my data, they, there are interviews where people with intellectual disabilities are asked questions about their life, about uh, how they, what kind of experiences they have of services they are using, um, their uh, personal relationships to other people, etc., different kind of questions. And then the third part of my data consists of uh, situations where people with uh, intellectual disabilities are taught new jobs because uh, this part of my data is recorded in a, a job center for people with uh, intellectual disabilities, uh, which we have quite many in Finland. And in these situations, the professionals are teaching a job, telling what to do next, how to accomplish it. And, and this is the third part of my data. And conversation analysis can be uh, familiar to many of you. Uh, to say it uh, briefly, the idea in this method is to go in the details and deep in that what happens between two conversationalists. So look what they really do, how they act, what kind of words they really use, and look uh, how they, uh, what kind of practices they use. We usually don't use the word um, strategies uh, when we talk about this situation, but rather about practices, how people approach each other, uh, how they um, react when they don't understand something. Uh, what they do uh, to find out what the other person has uh, said or meant. So all these kind of uh, uh, actions are analyzed uh, with this method. Uh, now, uh, today, I am not able to show you any videos of my data. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to do that. But um, hopefully, uh, one day, 
I'll be able to show you because really it is so that when you look at the situation, uh, how it happens, it gives you much better understanding on this. However, uh, what we learned today earlier from these, uh, from these uh, reports, uh, there were many situations and many results that you got from your questionnaire that I have seen in my uh, data. So I, I can really believe that uh, what you got, the answers are many in many parts what I have seen happening in authentic situations. Okay, change the slide. Do you understand when I speak? Do I speak too quickly or is it okay? I hope. Okay, um, let me start with uh, one line from my data. This is said by Penti. He's a man, 55, uh, 56 years old man with a learning disability, working in the center, uh, job center for persons with intellectual disabilities. And this is how he starts his answer in an interview where he has been asked about his life, personal stuff like this. And he starts by, by saying, oh, sorry, am I disturbing your conversation now? This is uh, translated because they are talking in Finnish. Now, why does Pente start his answer like this? It is uh, rather uh, puzzling to, to understand why we all know that if you are interviewed, you are supposed to talk and, and give answers. You, you are posed questions and then you answer to these questions. And um, how could he possibly be disturbing the conversation? And why does he say that this is your conversation when he's the one who is interviewed? Now, of course, this is only one occasion, one line from a large data, and it's from a specific moment. And as you see, uh, it is rather old. I have other kind of situations too. This is important to understand. Situations are always very different and people use language differently in each situation. However, I think it illustrates one important point uh, in conversations where people who need easy language attend. They are often having other people's conversations because they would need more support in this situation. And then I go uh, a little bit uh, down to what we have done uh, with easy language in Finland, in Finland in general, before going more in the guidelines for spoken easy language. Uh, here you see the definition of easy language that we use in Finland. Um, it basically says that Finnish, uh, easy Finnish is a language variety. We have different language varieties, and this is one of them uh, in which Words are more simple, uh, linguistic structures are more simple, and also contents are more, more uh, modified to be more readable and understandable. And the most important thing is said at the end lines, it is intended for people who have difficulties uh, in reading and in understanding standard language in Finland, standard Finnish. So this is... Uh, rather old definition we have used it in since uh, 90s in finland at the moment i have the feeling that maybe uh, we should look it again critically and change a few things in that but what is good in this definition is that it is not bound to texts and written language it gives you the possibility to broaden the idea of easy language to interaction to spoken situations. So this is the good side of this definition. A uh, few more uh, fundamental things about uh, how we use easy language. And I think these are the, the things and questions every country and in each uh, language area uh, one has to ask when promoting easy language. Um, for whom is it who is uh, the one who needs easy language? And um, in Finland, we don't group people who need easy language uh, through perhaps a diagnosis or illness or disability, uh, but the reason that lies behind the need for 
simplified language. And in uh, through this, we see uh, three different groups of people. There are people who need uh, linguistic support probably throughout their lives because they possess an inborn language uh, processing capacity, which differs from most other people. So this is uh, consisting one of these groups needing easy language according to our idea. This means that they may benefit easy language from childhood to old age um, during these uh, life, years of life, they may get more knowledge of uh, language uh, or they may uh, decrease in uh, linguistic skills. However, to have an independent life in Finland, they need linguistic support in form of easy language. Then another uh, kind of group who, may, who might uh, benefit easy language are people whose uh, need for linguistic support has developed during their lifetime because of um, illness or trauma or injury. And um, the process may have uh, been slow or it may have been rapid, but um, it has reduced their linguistic capacity so much that they need easy language to communicate, to express themselves, to get information and live independently. Then uh, as a third group, uh, we think uh, we have people who need linguistic support probably only temporarily uh, because they are learning a new language. And uh, they do have another language or way to communicate uh, that enables them to communicate with other people. But they need easy language when they talk to people who in Finland speak Finnish uh, and who do not master or are, do, are not familiar with their best language. It is common, but uh, not certain that the need for easy language decreases little by little uh, because uh, they learn Finnish language. But that's not always what happens. It is, however, important to recognize that uh, the need for easy language is very individual and it's personal matter too. So in each group, we have people who actually do not need easy language. And there are also people who would need other ways to support their communication. Kathy Basterfield mentioned uh, the so-called uh, AAC methods or augmentative and alternative uh, communication methods. And we have in each country people who benefit these methods also. So we always need to ask the people themselves, do they really need easy language? Do they want to use it and not to offer it uh, automatically to anybody? Uh, another thing, uh, in some countries, I know that uh, people who need easy language are divided in primary target groups and to secondary uh, target groups. And we don't see uh, this kind of, or we don't make this kind of distinction uh, in the target groups because we think that if people uh, want to benefit and use uh, easy language, they are equally entitled to do so. No, no secondary and non primary groups. Okay, um, then uh, there was uh, at least Kathy Basterfield and maybe some other speakers today also mentioned the difference between written contexts and spoken context and what it brings when we consider. Uh, these guidelines uh, that we could uh, give for, for spoken easy language. Um, we started in Finland with easy language in the 80s, and it took almost 20 years until we started to think that maybe we also need some kind of guidelines for spoken situations too. And to be honest, the first idea in the 90s or at the end of the 90s when this idea came uh, was that, okay, we have the guidelines for uh, written easy Finnish. So we simply put them to spoken context and we say that speak this way. Now you are understood. We all understand that didn't work out. It's not possible. Why can't we just take those guidelines from, uh, from a written context and put them to spoken context? Uh, that is, of course, connected to what written language is and what spoken language is. And this was also um, 
by by one speaker mentioned here uh, today quite interestingly one thing is uh, when you produce language uh, in written situations when you write you have time so you can consider which words are easy what linguistic structures to use you have all the time in the world to consider your linguistic choices but when you speak oh it's really rapid it's fractions of seconds where our brain is producing language considering making the choices now i use this word now i use that word uh, and that's why when we speak we speak wrong we all when we also uh, we um, often restart sentences we stop them we even speak grammatically incorrectly and that's not a problem in a spoken situation people understand each other because our ears have been uh, have been uh, during the uh, evaluation uh, they they have learned how to process spoken language so they they manage it but of course this has an impact on the process of producing easy language in spoken context so you can't say to somebody that now this is the vocabulary you can't use when you speak that's not the way to make a guideline for spoken situations another difference is maybe more connected to finnish language i'm not sure um, how it goes in other languages but in finnish we have quite different written language than spoken language and um, the written langu language follows the standardized standardized norms of uh, of language finnish language uh, where a spoken language is quite different this does not mean that spoken uh, language when we use spoken language we wouldn't be following some uh, they are not rules but some principles of course we have principles for using language um, when we speak but they are quite different and this has to be taken into account when we consider what are the good guidelines for spoken language then uh, a third uh, aspect is feedback uh, when we write we can and we should always get feedback from the readers this is what people call validation process in many countries people who need easy language give feedback uh, what they think what they understand what they do not understand in the text um, but it comes with delay we can't immediately when we write usually at least get uh, this kind of information but when we talk that's always possible we can get immediate feedback from our co-participant he or she uh, might uh, perhaps not saying but showing with other uh, with other methods with gestures with positions uh, with gaze uh, with looking away from us to show that now uh, something problematic came out i'm not understanding you and this is very important to take into account when we consider uh, the spoken easy language guidelines because it's a great benefit people can use it people can learn to use this kind of feedback when they speak of course it's not easy and they can misinterpret their uh, co-participant but that's at least one option that has to be taken into account okay um <clears throat> i have a few terms uh, that have been important mm -hmm. and um, uh, it, when doing research which i'd like to bring to you shortly and one of them is linguistic asymmetry with this term in conversation analytical research is uh, referred to a situation where the speakers do not uh, share the same linguistic abilities or capacities and uh, the, the the one who has more capacities and more uh, abilities to and resources uh, to use language is often uh, called uh, the more uh, the linguistically more competent speaker and the other one who who has less is often called uh, the speaker who needs linguistic support now um i find these uh, these terms a bit 
problematic because at least according to my own data, the more linguistically more competent speaker is not all the time the more competent speaker, but many times this person needs uh, linguistic support. And also uh, the person who needs linguistic support is not constantly in need of support. Many times this is the person who is supporting the linguistically more competent speaker. So these are critical views to these uh, terms. However, I think I have used them quite often in my own research. And of course, they have uh, some uh, good uh, sites too, because they illustrate uh, perhaps the situation uh, generally. Okay, but I hope you understand my critics towards them. Then um, another important um, uh, term, uh, which is also quite frequently used in conversation analytical research, is a typical interaction. And with this a term, uh, it is referred to, to a, a interaction where one speaker has a specific condition or disability that affects his or her ability to produce speech, to hear often, to understand or master uh, linguistic structures. Uh, this um, I think is not an official definition of this term, but Wilkinson uh, uses this term in his rather good um, uh, article in 2019. I hope you, I hope you read it because I, I think it's very illuminating. Now, this term is also quite uh, usable, but it has problems too, and and. One of them is that if we say something is a typical interaction, we should also define what is typical interaction. And that's really not easy when you look at authentic data. Of course, we can look at frequencies. People say certain things more frequently in situations where one speaker do not have a special condition or, or um, disability. And um, we could say that this is then the typical interaction. But uh, in many conversation analytical research, there are uh, situations showed where people who have no special linguistic uh, need for linguistic support um, use this kind of atypical uh, methods or atypical actions or do strange things. And that's... However, not atypical because they are not atypical speakers. Um, I would uh, suggest that this, uh, this uh, matter and this term atypicality would be looked critically. And we would perhaps uh, stop considering definitions that are based on diagnosis or are based on some speaker's special condition because they lead us to problematic uh, considerations, so I think. Okay. Um, well, as I said, in Finland, we have um, been thinking and reflect, reflecting um, guidelines for spoken uh, easy language for quite a while. First considerations were in the 90s and then Little by little, the idea of these guidelines developed. Uh, but often there has arisen the question that do we really need guidelines and why? What is the point of giving guidelines for easy language? And this is also something I've been thinking a lot and trying to find an answer for in my research. And the answer is that when you speak easy language, it's not easy. It is really challenging. Uh, in a, a research that concerns uh, native and non-native speakers uh, in Finland, made by uh, Maya Kalin uh, at the end of 90s, came out one uh, quite interesting result. She found out that when Finnish native speakers were having conversations with non-native Finnish uh, Finns or in Finnish, um, the native stopped being uh, really uh, uh, competent 
native speakers because they were trying to make it simple, because they were trying to be very precise and take into account what could be difficult in my own mother uh, language to this language learner. So this means that speaking easily is a challenge for the more competent speakers. And that is why, one reason why we need guidelines. Uh, however, we can't make guidelines that are like rules. We can't say to speakers that this is the right way to speak in each situation with each uh, speaker. Uh, but we can give guidelines and principles and ideas. And this is uh, my view to these uh, guidelines for spoken easy finish, that they could be a collection of tips, something that you can use when you are challenged by the linguistic asymmetry and the situation where you are talking. You can find their solutions, but you don't have to use them. So this, this is one uh, idea uh, that I would like to say to you that now when I'm, I'm going through uh, a few of these guidelines to present them to you, it is not like some kind of rules that one should uh, take and use every time. Uh, of course, uh, one reason for using or, or producing guidelines for spoken interaction is that uh, we also want to uh, increase chances for participation to people who need linguistic support in the form of easy language. Okay. Um, before going to more in detail to, to these guidelines, um, I would like to take up a um, uh, distinction that perhaps is relevant also to CELSI project and to those uh, guidelines that will be um, produced and, and done, uh, done uh, later on during this project. And um, when we talk about uh, speaking easily or using uh, easy language, we can distinguish between two slightly different settings or uh, situations where, uh, where we use language. We can consider uh, more institutional situations like interviews or teaching in a classroom or uh, lecturing or uh, guidance moments, for example, in my data, these are uh, more institutional of their nature. Or advising at a customer service when, when we have authorities who are giving uh, customer service, they also have customers who need easy language. How can they use their language in the most uh, simple way, make themselves understood, uh, deliver information in these situations. Also, we have mass media and we have uh, easy language media. In Finland, uh, the Finnish uh, broadcasting uh, company is sending every day uh, easy language news on television. And uh, how they use language, how they uh, pronounce Finnish, what kind of words they use, how they deliver news and journalistic information. Uh, with easy finish, that is one issue that needs to be considered when we think about these guidelines. Okay, uh, then another setting is uh, situations where people use language more freely. That is uh, mainly everyday conversations. And this has been uh, my uh, main focus in my research chatting with friends and family members, uh, sharing ideas and experiences, uh, informal talks at home, at work. Informal talks can also occur uh, in, in a classroom. It's not necessarily only lecturing that we have in a classroom. And then uh, we have um, situations where we have to think about reciprocity and, and how uh, to make the atmosphere uh, such that each person can attend and be part of the situation, share ideas and views. Uh, and this is more free settings of 
using spoken easy language. Now, if we compare these uh, two settings, um, sure, they are not completely different. They are not exclu exclusive what comes to the use of language or actions uh, that could be relevant and useful in these situations. However, there is a focus point that differs. Uh, when we think about uh, easy language news or audio uh, descriptions or, or more official uh, uh, or institutionally orientized situations, the focus is uh, often on language. Uh, how I speak, what I say, uh, can I plan my speaking in advance? Uh, if I say first this thing, should I then continue to that? And would it be logical to go to the third point after that, or maybe before that? So this kind of uh, pre-planning is relevant when you have this kind of um, uh, more institutional uh, settings to use language. But when you are chatting with someone, uh, that's not relevant. The focus is more on actions. What you do there, is there a chance uh, for each person to take the conversation in a new road, to change the, uh, the subject or the topic, uh, start talking about something that the one with linguistic needs finds uh, interesting, or is the conversation actually mainly on the topics that the more competent speaker finds interesting? So this kind of action basis is uh, highlighted or coming more relevant in uh, free everyday conversations. Uh, however, also in these free conversations, uh, we need to consider the language, the vocabulary that is familiar to, the, uh, to our uh, co-participants, uh, linguistic structures, um, how we emphasize things, what we bring up uh, with our voice and, and um, use of uh, gestures, etc. But maybe actions are uh, the first thing that we consider in this, these uh, free everyday conversations. And now you see here um, uh, the, a set of um, Guidelines or action, actually you see the titles of the subsections of the guidelines. And um, in 2012, we published uh, in Finland uh, these guidelines. So they are now uh, 10 years old. And in my research, one idea has been to go through these uh, guidelines and reconsider them to see what I see in the authentic data in the real conversations between uh, unequal uh, partners uh, talking with each other. Do some practices seem uh, still relevant and uh, good to give us advices to the speaker or maybe uh, not relevant? Um, basically, I could say that um, most of the guidelines of these 45 guidelines, I still think are relevant. I can see them happening uh, in the data. But uh, a few of them uh, actually are at the list which I would like to delete from the list. Uh, one of them uh, has something to do with using verbs. We used to have there a guideline that uh, encourages the more competent speaker to use verbs and uh, finite verbs, the, the verbs that are conjugated, because uh, as actually mentioned here earlier, verbs are important and often the actions are connected to the verbs. But when I looked at the real situations, it turned out that in many times people do not, when they speak, need the verbs. They can make themselves clear without the verbs. And this uh, mainly concerns the free conversations. So I guess in institutional settings, uh, still we need the verbs to make us understandable. But actually in these free conversations, people often um, 
were using language that was not so clear if you compare it with that, what we say about written Easy Finnish, because the verbs were lacking. This, of course, illustrates the fact that in spoken situations, it's not only the words, it's only, not only the language that is relevant and bringing the information between people. There are other ways and other uh, uh, things that support this communication, which was very nicely brought up by Kathy Pastafid uh, after uh, in the in the earlier in her earlier speech. Okay, you see here, however, those uh, five subsections. Uh, the one is uh, to orient to the situation. Second is encountering with a person to to show that you're present. Um, one thing, these are translated to English by myself. I'm not sure if they are very correct. I uh, have to say this because uh, if you wonder some uh, words I have used, maybe this is the reason that my, my English is not perfect. Okay, the third uh, part or subsection of these guidelines concerns uh, reciprocity and turn taking in conversations. Number four is uh, the nice part uh, that's uh, speak easy language. This is uh, the subsection that is uh, uh, of most connected to what we know about written easy Finnish. So there is uh, similarities in, in the, the uh, fourth subsection. And as uh, the last section, we have checking and repairing. Uh, of course, in these conversations, there's a lot of misunderstandings. There are understanding troubles. There are also uh, situations quite frequently where the speakers do not accept what the other one has said. And in these situations, we need uh, checking. We need practices for repairing what we are saying, what has been said. And these are uh, advices for these kind of situation are collected in this uh, fifth uh, subsection. Uh, and now I was thinking that I could go uh, through these subsections. I can't uh, go each and every one of these guidelines. But I think that those that I take up as an examples give you an idea uh, about the reflections uh, that lie behind these uh, guidelines. And one uh, quite important um, observation, which was made quite early in, in Finland when looking at authentic data, was that uh, situations with linguistic asymmetry where the more competent sp uh, speaker started uh, with some sort of orientation to the situation, uh, started better than those where they went straight to the point. So this kind of orientation seemed to us rather important. However, uh, the more competent speakers uh, seem not to be very eager to make this kind of orientation. I don't know if uh, this is connected to those results you got in, in your uh, questionnaire from uh, different countries that perhaps in conversations, it's not easy to start with an orientating uh, lines. It is maybe a little bit teacher-like or people feel like uh, predicting or, or being uh, too strict or I don't know, these are assumptions because I haven't asked the more competent speakers why they don't use this kind of orientating um, practices so much. But when they occur, at least in my, my data, they seem very efficient. Uh, the person who needs easy language uh, gets mu much better launch to the situation when uh, he or she is told what is coming now, what, uh, what we are going to do now, what is relevant in this situation. Of course, this has to be done delicately. We can't um, uh, say it um, without taking into account that maybe the person we are talking with has another idea of what is going on. At least in pre-conversations, this is quite important. 
uh, we can't di dictate uh, what is happening now in free conversations. But in case we are accomplishing uh, some sort of institutional task, uh, it is quite good to start with orientation and to make uh, into words what is coming now, what is happening next, uh, what I think is now uh, a good way to act in this situation. So there is a recommendation uh, in these guidelines that says that help your co-participant to orient themselves to the situation at hand. Then there are, of course, uh, uh, other guidelines that uh, give uh, hints or ideas how this can be done. Um, another thing quite important uh, is that situations where we use language in sp spoken situations are different and they happen in different environments and in different conditions and also the speakers are um, sometimes tired and sometimes they are energetic and eager to talk and this all should be taken into consideration in the start of the situation um there should the the more competent speaker should uh, consider for example if there is uh, some kind of a background noise or if the lightning is blinking, or uh, there is a lot of traffic around them, or, or, or if uh, it is possible that uh, the co-participant is tired or anxious, or there is something else uh, that should be taken into account just in the beginning. Of course, if it is possible to appease the speaking environment, that's great. It's not always possible, but if it is possible, then people should do that. So this is uh, these are uh, orienting uh, ideas that are gathered in this first uh, subsection of the guidelines for spoken easy Finnish. Then um, encountering or meeting a person and being present, uh, this uh, guideline uh, or these these guidelines uh, came out from the from the observation that often uh, people who need easy language uh, do not feel uh, that they are met in the situation. Uh, they might be uh, nervous about the situation. So all kind of practices that uh, make the situation secure. And, and make them feel uh, of uh, having uh, uh, being able to count on on the more competent speaker and on their abilities to solve the problems that perhaps will occur are worthwhile of trying. And one uh, thing is that cooperation uh, should be cherished in all possible ways, because talking means that people are doing cooperation. This is also something that differs when we consider writing and, and speaking. When we write an easy language text, we are the persons who are creating the linguistic, uh, linguistic environment. But when we talk, we are not the only persons creating the atmosphere, making it uh, safe and, and good for both partners. There is this other person, and, and that is why cooperation is so important. We are doing it together. So uh, what we recommend uh, the more competent speakers to, to take uh, into account is that uh, the, the, the uh, atmosphere is uh, as relaxed as possible, as safe as possible, uh, and that there is no rush or hurry to go in some place that the more competent speakers are not expressing of uh, like uh, like they are uncomfortable with the situation, uh, but that they are um, feeling good right now, talking with this person, uh, talking about this topic they are having at the moment. Uh, it is not easy, I must say. I've been uh, doing these uh, situations myself with people who need easy finish. And often this is uh, the greatest challenge that I have the feeling that I don't have 
ways. I don't know how to make this situation safe. But there are a few things that I could re recommend uh, for the more competent speakers. Uh, one thing is that uh, persons uh, who need easy language uh, do not often know how to take the conversation to that direction they find interesting. They don't have these kind of uh, fluent ways to circulate uh, uh, around the topics, and they might be puzzled. They have an idea what they want to talk about. I would like to talk about this and that, but they don't know how to reach it, how to uh, make them go through. So this is also something we could uh, recommend the more competent speakers to be sensitive and to take uh, uh, care that the co-participant who needs easy language uh, has the chance, of course, according to her or his uh, uh, capabilities, uh, to be responsible where the conversation is going and heading. So this is a not easy task, but something the more competent speakers should be aware of and consider giving floor for the less competent speaker to take the conversation to new topics. Of course, uh, listening, which has been mentioned many times uh, during today, uh, is absolutely important. It is often more, more important than choosing the simplest words and structures to be able to listen the co-participant sensitively and adjust one speak according to that level that seems good and appropriate uh, in this situation and to this co-participant. Uh, listening is not easy either. It is also quite challenging because it demands that one gives more time than one is used to. Uh, one is uh, patient uh, and, and gives the chance for uh, the less competent partner to take again, start over again, uh, repeat things. And uh, this is sometimes quite difficult for speakers to be patient enough and to give enough floor. And when, while we are listening sensitively, our co-participants, we should also express our listening and sensitivity with our gestures, um, how, we, how close we are our co-participants, our positions, and also verbally giving feedback that we are really here and we are hearing what the other person says. And then reciprocity and turn-taking, um, that's absolutely necessary part of uh, guidelines for spoken easy language. Uh, terms in a conversation, they are like sentences in a written text. Uh, conversations are based on terms, and these terms should be taken uh, reciprocally so that not one person is speaking all the time or a long time, but both have the chance to come into that conversation. And this is exact, exactly what needs uh, us as more competent speakers to give the co-participant enough time to react, first to understand what we say, then uh, decide what they want to uh, at or react to that, what we said, but also maybe they don't want to react. They want to go in another direction of the talk and there they should also have time enough. Reciprocity uh, is sometimes difficult in these uh, linguistically asymmetric conversations because um, uh, the person who needs easy language uh, uh, he, his or her pace in the conversation is different from that what we are used to, but also because they might not be fluently um, expressing those places in a conversation where they are uh, reacting or where they are changing the direction of the talk. And when the talk goes uh, a little uh, 
not intact, we often react to this uh, uh, somehow unconsciously. We don't um, we don't think that now we have a problem that this conversation or the turn taking is not intact, but we have the feeling of uncomfortable that this is uncomfortable. This is not going the way we would want it to go. And it is difficult to correct this kind of uh, conversation going, uh, turn taking that is not intact. One way are questions. We can make questions, we can ask. And ask uh, when we ask a question, uh, then there usually comes an answer to this, and that makes the conversation to progress uh, more intact often, but not always. And asking questions is not uh, unproblematic because if we are as uh, small competent speakers posing questions all the time, the conversation starts to go wrong. It can, for example, make the atmosphere a little bit examinating. We are asking all the time questions and our co-participants should all the time react and produce answers. Uh, also, what is obvious in my own research data is that um, people who need easy language uh, often find it difficult to answer, especially to open questions. I think this was also in some countries um, answers uh, that we heard today. So when 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 you ask questions, it is a good practice because uh, with questions you can show that you're interested in the other person and you you want to talk with him or her. Also, you can make uh, this reciprocity to work a little bit better, but you have to be careful because if you are asking all the time, then uh, the situation uh, can start to be uh, awkward. And um, then um, uh, another thing uh, in re concerning reciprocity and turn-taking uh, in these conversations is that a person who needs easy language uh, is often said to be not so initiative in the conversation. But there are certain ways through which uh, we can make it's clear that we encourage this kind of uh, initiatives shown by the person who needs easy language. Uh, that can be uh, mimics, that can be gestures, that can be questions, that can be also just listening. There are ways to show support and encourage uh, the co-participants to be initiative. Okay, then speaking easy language. Uh, as I said, this part is rather large. We have many uh, guidelines and ideas how to use language in spoken situations. Partly these uh, concern Finnish language and they are uh, partly language dependent, but I think there are also quite many that are universal and, and usable in other languages too. And as you see, when you look at the list, in case you can uh, read it, hopefully, uh, you can see that these have similarities to those uh, guidelines we have for written easy language. Of course, when we speak, we should try to use uh, words that we suppose are familiar to our uh, co-participants. And in case we need to use uh, words that are not familiar or we suppose they are not familiar, we should try to explain them. And that's difficult, especially difficult when we speak, when we only have a fraction of seconds to explain certain things. And things in this world are difficult. So explaining them in a spoken situation is demanding. Um, we also give the guideline for using uh, language structures that are commonly used in spoken language. As I mentioned, spoken and written uh, Finnish differ from each other. And sometimes Finnish people think that when they need to speak uh, easy Finnish, they should speak like they write. And this is not at all a good idea. Uh, when they start doing that, they regularly do, 
uh, the the whole uh, situation starts to be really bad for the person with uh, with the need for easy language. So we say use spoken language. Uh, don't be afraid of using uh, spoken language structures. Then intonation uh, that helps distinguishing uh, what is most important in that what you say. Uh, to make clear intonation, uh, pitching, uh, keeping pauses, uh, etc. These are important uh, guidelines also. Um, however, uh, what we noticed uh, about pauses was that sometimes the more competent speakers started to keep pauses between each words. And then they were thinking that now I am very clear, this is easy. And no, it is not at all easy. In these situations, uh, the person who needs his language was completely lost. So do not keep pauses between each word, but keep a little bit longer pause uh, uh, at the end of each speaking segment. A speaking segment is a little bit uh, difficult to define, but meaning one uh, whole that a person usually expresses at once. And there the pause looks like it works. It makes uh, what you say more understandable. Then the figures of speech, uh, metaphoric language. Of course, it is difficult not only in written language, but also in spoken language. So one should be careful when using uh, metaphors and, and figures, figures of speech. However, uh, when using this kind of common figures uh, and metaphors, uh, it brings the situation humor often. It makes it lighter. Uh, people maybe laugh. And this makes the atmosphere uh, more nice for the speakers. So we do not say that never use uh, figures of speech or metaphors but use them carefully and use only common metaphors. Abstract language, this is of course uh, quite understandable, that it is always uh, or almost always difficult. But the things people have to talk about are very often abstract. So you have to speak about abstract things, but you should do it in a concrete way and use language that is concrete. And that's of course a challenge. Uh, what the the good um, uh, those those who were um, using very good uh, easy language in my data, what they did was that when they were talking about uh, certain abstract topics, they had in mind uh, how to illustrate this thing with a concrete example, and this worked out well. Okay, thanks. Um, then, of course, uh, there are other ways that needs to be taken into uh, consideration. Um, maybe the co-participant has another communication method, or, or uh, you have a, uh, you you know uh, some sort of, uh, of uh, you you can illustrate or or you can sign language. Uh, and if your co-participant co is familiar with these methods, go ahead and use them when you speak easy language. That's, that's a good idea. But unfortunately, I also have in my data situations where people think that I have to use these methods because I'm speaking to someone who needs easy language. And they are perhaps not so familiar uh, with this kind of method, or the co-participant is not so familiar with this method. And of course, it's not helping in that situation. So use them if you both are familiar with this method. Okay, I'm coming to my almost last slide. Uh, checking and repairing. Uh, in these conversations, there are a lot of understanding troubles. Uh, actually, in my own data, there are conversations that go from one understanding trouble to another constantly people are repairing, trying to find out what was said. Uh, is this interpretation correct? Can I ask this one more time? 
because people usually can ask only two times the same thing. And after that, they try to do something else. So checking and repairing is highly important and relevant in these conversations. However, it is important also to understand that it is not needed in each situation where other easy language, uh, spoken easy language guidelines could be relevant. So be sensitive to your co-participant is the guideline uh, we use. Uh, those repair initiators that are commonly used in each uh, spoken situation are very good also when you use easy language. They can be questions, what is X, uh, what, how, etc. They can be repeats, they can be interpretations, uh, and through these ways uh, one can find out what was the problem in, in the talk. Quite often, if the problem is uh, very keen, if it is difficult uh, to solve, you need all of them. You can't pick up just one repair initiator. For example, it is in disability etiquette, I have seen a guideline that says that only use open questions, do never interpret. So this is not a guideline that I would give uh, because you usually need all of these repair initiators. However, it is good if you don't uh, pretend that you understand if you do not understand. I understand it's human. Sometimes you have to like let go and, and okay, now we try to solve this problem. It's, uh, it's not solving, let's go on. And that's normal and that's okay. But often when the situation repeats and when you are uh, over and over again in a situation where you have to let it pass, then it starts to bother both conversationalists. And in that case, and for this reason, uh, we give the guideline that do not pretend, if it's possible, do not pretend that you understand if you do not. And I am also <laughs> done here. One more, uh, I'll, I'll show you here our references. And if you just can take one more slide. This is Kitos. Selfsy, spoken easy language for social inclusion. Partners are Zavo Trisa, RTV Slovenia, Dyslexi Verbundet, Universita degli Studi di Trieste, Vieglas Valodas Agentura, Vilnius Universitetas, Vsi Informatio Scaupimo Irsklaidos Centras. Funded by the European Union.